Thank you. Thank you for coming out, actually, on such a cold evening. And um, I'm very happy this evening to introduce our speaker to you in a minute. But before that, I'd just like to just explain what we're doing this evening. Uh, this is a third of a series of lectures that are introduced by the Center of the Study of Islam in the UK, the School of Religious and Theological Studies. And they're convened by the director, Sophie Gillian Frey, who's with us this evening. And um, uh, next week, I hope you'll we'll also come out because we've got someone coming from outside Canada. Uh, he's traveling all the way from Cambridge, which is not an easy, um, uh, easy sort of visit, uh, easy journey time. So I hope you'll come. Uh, it's uh, Tim Winter, uh, also known to you as Abdul Hakim Murad, so I think that he's well known to many of you. And I hope you'll pass the message on to your colleagues, etc., who, who know his work and his public speaking engagements across the country. Now this evening, uh, our speaker is going to speak for about uh, 40 minutes, after which he very kindly uh, agreed to take questions from the audience for another 10, 15 minutes or so. Uh, so that's the kind of timeline that we're going to be running on. And um, if I could just ask you to switch your mobile phones off, that would be great. And um, so I'll just start introducing. We've got, we're very happy to welcome Russell Sandberg this evening from uh, uh, from law, and uh, we're, we're also happy that he's, you know, working with the centre. So I'm very happy to say that in particular, that he's part of the activities on the centre for the study of Islam in the UK, just to showcase the sort of variety and diversity of the work that the centre is involved in, and it's sort of working with different people across the university. And the, the title of his talk is this evening going to be um, English Law and Islam, or Islam and English Law, whichever about Islam and English law. And uh, he's going to finish by talking to you about a very interesting project that the center is running concerning this. Um, he's lecturer in law, and uh, he's published in a range of different journals, including the very well-known Modern Law Review. And he's got a forthcoming uh, book coming out uh, called Law and Religion, New Horizons collection of essays, which is going to be coming out shortly. So I'd just like you to uh, welcome Russell Sander, and i give you a good show. Thank you very much for the kind introduction and the warm welcome. I'm pleased to be speaking tonight on an uncontroversial subject, the relationship between Islam and English law. Oh dear, never mind. Just over two years ago, on the 7th of February 2008, a lecture on the same theme by the Archbishop of Canterbury caused uproar. The television news illustrated the item with footage of stonings. The front page of the sun screamed hysterically, what a burqa, whilst other newspapers, such as the Daily Mail, called for the Archbishop's resignation. The furor considered, continued for some time. Senior figure after senior figure came out to condemn the Archbishop. And in many ways, tonight's lecture runs in parallel to that of the Archbishop. Whilst he was a theologian speaking in a legal setting, I am a lawyer speaking in a theological setting. Whilst his lecture was subtitled A Religious Perspective, mine may be subtitled A Legal Perspective. And whilst the Archbishop's lecture was very theoretical, I intend mine to be much more practical. One thing we do have in common is our external perspective. Neither myself nor the Archbishop are experts in Islamic law. This lecture is not about the content or the nature of Islamic law. It's rather about the accommodation of Islamic laws and Islamic religious practices today in English law. In short, this evening, I wish to delve beyond the headlines and beyond the hysteria. I want to discuss the current legal position, not only to undermine the hullabaloo which existed over the last two years, but also so that we can move forward. Before any changes are made in any direction, we need to understand the current position as it is in the law books and as it is interpreted and used on the ground. Now, that understanding was lacking in responses to the Archbishop's lecture. And that was just not just the media. Senior politicians sprouted simplistic statements that suggested that the choice was a clear dichotomy. 
Either we incorporate Sharia law as a whole, or we allow no accommodation whatsoever. Now, I'm sure you're already thinking there's a whole range of difference, plenty of room between those two extremes. But that argument was advanced by politicians in the aftermath of the lecture. Number 10, for instance, was said to be clear that in Britain, British laws based on British values applied. Gordon Brown there seeming to ignore the fact that there's no such thing technically as British law. The legal system of Scotland differs significantly from that of England, and thanks to developments in the Bay, the legal system of Wales is now different in, and will be different in future years from that of England. Similarly, the then Culture Secretary commented on question time, and I quote, you cannot run two systems of law alongside each other. That would be a recipe for chaos. And that seems to ignore the fact that other systems of law are already accommodative in UK law. Um, to take a textbook example, European Union law and the decisions of the European Court of Human Rights are recognised as part of the English legal system. They have not led to chaos, as the, as the then Culture Secretary has suggested. And moreover, and this is the theme of tonight's lecture, it is already the case that religious laws, including Islamic law, do exist alongside the law of the land. And they have done so for some time. If you speak to legal historians, they will often point out that the earliest courts in England that looked like a court of law were the courts of the church. And similarly, their decisions, the decisions of the ecclesiastical courts, have shaped key areas of English law to this day particularly in, uh, in relation to family law. In the case of the Church of England, its law is part of the general law of England. If you wander over to the law library and you pick up a volume of Acts of Parliament, you will find in that same volume pieces of religious law. Pieces of church law called measures are created by a religious body, the General Synod of the Church of England, but are then considered by the Ecclesiastical Committee of Parliament. And once given royal assent, they have the same effect as an Act of Parliament. So it's simply not the case that religious laws do not run alongside the law of the land. And in tonight's lecture, I want to explain how that applies outside the established church. Now, most of what I'm going to say relates to Islam, but most of it is of general application. It also applies to Roman Catholic canon law, Jewish law, and the rules and regulations of any religious group. So this lecture tonight will outline the ways in which English law currently recognizes or allows Islamic laws and Islamic religious practices. And I want to pay particular attention to a piece of legislation called the Arbitration Act 1996, because it's that piece of legislation which has often been confused in the media reports. Now, I must stress at the outset that I'm not saying that the current position is perfect. My argument is that the current position is misunderstood. The Archbishop's lecture called on us, and I quote, to think a little harder about the role and rule of law in a plural society of overlapping identities. However, we simply cannot do that unless we understand what the current position is now as it is in the law books, and as it is interpreted and used on the ground. In short, what is the truth behind the headlines? At the start, I want to begin by making a few general points about the regulation of religion in England and Wales. Under English law, there's a multitude of overlapping laws which regulate religion and which protect both religious groups and religious individuals. Focusing first on religious groups, since toleration, religious groups other than the Church of England have been lawful and have been allowed to practice their religion. Religious buildings can be registered as places of religious worship and for the solemnization of marriage. And if they are registered, certain fiscal advantages are achieved. But unlike many other European countries, Registration is not compulsory here. Regardless of registration status, 
religious groups are usually treated as voluntary associations whose members are bound together as part of a private agreement. They exist in law, and here comes the technical term, as unincorporated associations. Basically, two or more people come in together and voluntarily decided to be bound for common purposes and to undertake mutual duties and obligations. The rules and structures of these voluntary groups are binding upon assenting members. And this contractual bond is often styled the doctrine of consensual compact. One of the best definitions I've found is in a case called Long and the Bishop of Cape Town, where Lord Kingsdon said, members may adopt rules for enforcing discipline within their bodies, which will be binding on those who expressly or by implications have assented to them. I'll repeat that. I think it's worth repeating. Members may adopt rules for enforcing discipline within their body, which will be binding on those who expressly or by implication have assented to them. So if you're a member of a golf club, if you're a member of a religious group and you assent to the rules, those rules are binding on you. And it's often understood that the rules are also binding on the association itself. Now, the courts of the state are generally reluctant to become involved in adjudicating disputes within religious groups. However, they will exceptionally intervene to enforce these laws, typically where there's a financial interest or where property is involved. So in those cases, those rules decided by members themselves will be enforced by a secular court. Moving on to religious individuals, the traditional legal position has been that everyone has a right to do whatever they want unless constrained by the law. Where the law is silent, where there's no legal prohibition, you can do whatever you want. This negative protection of religious freedom has been buttressed in recent years by an avalanche of law concerning religion. Most notably, the Human Rights Act, which brought uh, Article 9 on freedom of thought, concert, and religion into English law, and new laws forbidding discrimination on grounds of religion or belief. Individual religiosity is more regulated now than it's ever been. And these two pieces of positive laws may be seen as the two pillars of our law on religion today. And it is true that these laws have led to a great deal of litigation. Almost every week, there's a tribunal decision concerning religion. Don't take my word for it. Look at that well-established legal journal, the Metro. Mm. However, the effectiveness of these laws is open to doubt. These positive rights have been interpreted narrowly by judges. For instance, and this is a separate lecture, but I just raised it to illustrate the point. All of the claimants who have brought Article 9 claims in relation to the wearing of religious dress and symbols have lost their case. There has been developments, particularly in relation to discrimination law, um, particularly in relation to working hours. But generally speaking, these new positive laws have been interpreted rather restrictively. But like I say, that's a separate lecture. The basic point I want to make tonight is that there are various ways in which English law protects religious groups and individuals, in addition to this general um, regulatory backdrop. And the key fact I want to stress at the outset is the negative protection continues, because this is overlooked often by commentators. Religious laws and practices remain free to operate where the law of the state is silent. And for instance, some family lawyers have argued that the silence of the law allows uh, numerous polygamous religious marriages because the offence of blasphemy, uh, the offence of bigamy, oh, that was a bit of Freudian slip there, the offence of bigamy uh, is restrictedly 
drafted to cover only civil marriages, not religious ones. So you can marry as a matter of a religion as many times as you want. The law is only get involved where you uh, go through a civil ceremony. And in addition, in addition to this negative freedom, which may be bolstered by the general guarantees of human rights and discrimination laws, there are four ways in which English law may be said to positively recognize Islamic laws and Islamic religious practices. And those are the four ways I want to focus on today. The first way is recognition as a matter of fact. The second, recognition through state law. The third, recognition by the Arbitration Act 1996. I'm aware, of course, that the second heading could easily subsume the third, since the Arbitration Act is clearly a piece of state law. But given its importance and popular misunderstandings, I want to deal with that separately. And also, fourth, recognition through private international law. So to move to my first heading, recognition as a matter of fact, this can be dealt with rather straightforwardly. Religious law may enter the courtroom as part of the facts of the case, the same as any other phenomenon. And religious law may be introduced into the courtroom by expert witnesses. May I say at the outset, what we lack in relation to this is detailed research. We don't know the extent to which that takes place. There's a number of academic commentators who've said it does take place, but they don't cite any authority for it. There are numerous cases where it's clear it has taken place, but we don't know to what extent it's been listened to, etc., and to what extent it actually goes ahead. The second, and the one which we have a bit more evidence on what the law actually states, although a lack of evidence in terms of practice, is recognition through state law. Pieces of state law may give effect to provisions of Islamic law, or more generally, uh, Islamic religious practices. For instance, special rules on slaughter, allowing Muslim method for food, for food of Muslims by a Muslim who holds a license, and financial provisions allowing Islamic bank sharia, compliant mortgages, and Islamic bonds. There's also developments in family law. The Adoption and Children Act 2002 introduced special guardianship as a means of parental responsibility alternative to adoption. This fostering arrangement, thus according to commentators at least, takes into account the traditional Muslim prohibition on adoption. Moreover, the Divorce Religious Marriages Act 2002 enables courts to require the granting of a religious divorce before a civil divorce can be granted. This removes problematic situations where the man allows there to be a civil divorce, but then refuses the grant of the religious divorce. But such solutions are often not perfect. State law is a blunt instrument, often incapable of dealing with the nuances found within faith communities. For instance, the Divorce Religious Marriages Act 2002 does not deal with the situation where the man refuses a divorce full stop. Moreover, it was enacted in the context of the Jewish get. And so the statute only applies to marriages which have been solemnized in accordance with the usages of the Jews or any other prescribed religious usages. So the Muslim community cannot yet rely on that unless they request so of the government. The state law in this area is facilitative but is not sufficiently pluralistic. And the major problem of state laws recognizing religious diversity is that the greatest strength here is also the greatest weakness. The greatest strength is that if the state deals with it, there's no dispute <laughs> as to the religious body taking on state functions or rival in the state. But similarly, that strength is also a weakness because it then means that the religious person in question, religious groups in question, are dependent upon the state. 
And these provisions are often seen as a favour on the part of the state, which can be altered by the state at any time. And if you want to see a clear example of that, the current first um, concern in the exceptions to religious groups in the Equality Bill, uh, currently before Parliament, really illustrates that. <coughs> My third heading is recognition by the Arbitration Act 1996. <coughs> specific legal provisions dealing with, as the law sees it, specific religious problems by extending the protection and reach of state law is largely uncontroversial compared with the operation of religious courts. If I was to point out one line in the Archbishop's lecture which caused most concern, it would be the line when he said we need to think about, and I quote, something like a delegation of certain legal functions to the religious courts of a community. This led to media fears of unaccountable courts passing sentences on criminal liability in ways that undermined the whole of British democracy. That was before the expenses scandal did precisely that. However, the media representation, surprise, surprise, was not exactly accurate. Now, the key piece of law here is the Arbitration Act 1996. It's the latest in a long line of similar statutes. And the key thing to notice about the Arbitration Act is it focuses not upon courts, but upon people. Now, the basics of the Act are quite straightforward. Section 1 provides, parties should be free to agree on how their disputes are resolved, subject only to such safeguards as are necessary in the public interest. That basically means people can decide how disputes between them are to be resolved, and once parties decide to be bound by that decision, then the secular court will enforce that arbitration agreement under the general secular law of contract. There are two main limitations on this. The first limitation is, as stated in section one, public policy. The secular court will not enforce an arbitration award where there is a public policy which requires the court not to. An agreement to arbitrate is like any other contract. It is necessary to, so, to show a genuine agreement by both parties. If the contract is obtained by duress or formed with those with minors or those incapable, it will not be enforced. And moreover, the agreement to arbitrate must be in writing. Section 33 of the Act states the general duty of the arbitrator. It must act fairly and impartially as between the parties, giving each party a reasonable opportunity of putting his case and dealing with that of his opponent. If it doesn't comply with that, if the decision does not comply with that, or several other requirements laid out in the Act as serious irregularities, then the arbitration award will not be enforced by the English court. Now, the importance of this limitation is shown in the Court of Appeal decision in Solmony and Solmony. In that case, two Iranian Jewish merchants were exporting Persian carpets. This breached Iranian law. They went to Beth Din in London because they fell out and they wanted an agreement about what to do with the carpet. And the Beth Din considered the irregularity irrelevant under Jewish law and so made an arbitration award. The Court of Appeal, however, the secular court, recognised this arbitration award as a valid agreement, but refused to enforce it on the grounds that public policy would not allow an English court to enforce an illegal contract. That did not affect the court's decision that the Beth Din had jurisdiction operating under the Arbitration Act, but nevertheless it was not enforced. The court held, and I quote, an award, whether domestic or foreign, 
will not be enforced by an English court if enforcement would be contrary to the public policy of this country. So that's the first limitation, must not be contrary to public policy. The second limitation is that the Arbitration Act only applies to civil disputes. The criminal law is outside its operation. A victim and a defendant could not agree for a breach of English criminal law to be determined by arbitration, because under English criminal law, the dispute isn't between the parties, but it's between the state, the crown, and the defendant. And English law provides no general um, civil right for victims to have their defendant punished. Similarly, if any religious court used the Arbitration Act to decide on imprisonment or physical punishment for a religious offence, the first question would be whether the uh, defendant in that case had voluntarily assented to the court's judgment. The second question would be that any imprisonment could not be enforced by the courts. The arbitration awards are enforced by civil courts. With the exception of, ex of contempt of court, civil courts have no power to imprison anyone. And a religious court enforcing punishment would find itself liable under English criminal law for assault or false imprisonment. The Arbitration Act is largely used for commercial purposes. It has many advantages. It's private, it's cheap, and it's more flexible than state law, than state judgment. There's also an international treaty agreement, often referred to as the New York Convention, which enables arbitration awards between parties from different states to be enforced easily, which wouldn't be the case if they went straight to a secular court. But, and here I come to my punchline, the Arbitration Act 1996 can also be used for religious purposes. Now, technically, it's not used by religious courts themselves, like the Beth Din or the um, Surrey Councils, but it's rather used by people who want to take their dispute to a religious court for arbitration. And the key fact about arbitration is it allows the parties to decide what law the arbitrators will use to decide their dispute. And the key section here is section 46. Because section 46 enables parties to choose for their disputes to be decided in accordance with other considerations. In accordance with other considerations as opposed to in accordance with law. Now, for these purposes, in accordance with law is defined as meaning the law of the state, or the law of a state. Other considerations, however, can extend to other systems of law which are not part of the state, such as religious law. So section 46 thus allows parties to decide that their dispute is to be decided in accordance with systems of religious law, such as Jewish law or Islamic law. And the important thing to note is just because it's not seen as law doesn't mean it's not binding. If an agreement is made to arbitrate, then any dispute on that matter in front of the secular courts will be paused. The courts will refuse to consider that dispute and rather than looking at the dispute itself, the facts, will simply enforce the decision the arbitrator has made. And one of the few changes made to the law of arbitration by the 1996 Act is that it severely limits the right to appeal from an arbitration award. It's also equally important to note that the provisions of the Arbitration Act do not allow the state to wash its hands of the matter. Human rights instruments stress the importance of the right to a fair trial, and the state will be liable if religious courts do not live up to those basic standards. At the level of the United Nations, this is protected by Article 14 of the International Covenant. 
and the Human Rights Committee has stressed that Article 14, and I quote, applies to courts based on customary law or religious courts who carry out judicial tasks. It must be ensured, thus by the state, that such courts cannot hand down binding judgments recognised by the state unless the following requirements are met. And then it gives a list of requirements which basically add up to the right to a fair trial. This right to a fair trial is also part of domestic law and of Human Rights Act, Article 6. And decisions of the European Court of Human Rights suggest that Article 6 will also be important in relation to religious courts here. The significant decision is that of Pellegrini and Italy, um, a case in 2002. This concerned Roman Catholic annulment proceedings in the ecclesiastical court, where the applicant was not told the nature of proceedings in advance and was not allowed to read her husband's witness statements. The Italian courts made operative Vatican Court's declaration of nullity. The European Court of Human Rights held the proceedings of the ecclesiastical courts breached Article 6. In that, the applicant's right to a fair trial had been compromised. And the claim was not against the Vatican, because the Vatican was not party to the Convention. The claim was against the Italian state. The Italian state had breached Article 6. They sort of refused to confirm the outcome of such unfair proceedings, said the court. They had failed in their duty to check that the applicant had enjoyed a fair trial in the ecclesiastical proceedings. It follows that the United Kingdom would be in breach of Article 6 if a religious court failed to meet Article 6 standards as the right to a fair trial, and then that decision was enforced under the Arbitration Act. Now, there are many examples of decisions of religious courts being enforced under the Arbitration Act, especially the Jewish Beth Din. There are fewer examples in relation to Islamic courts, and there's evidence of at least one case where the decision of the Islamic Sharia Council of London was not so enforced. And some commentators have seized on that to say that Islamic courts' decisions cannot be enforced by the Arbitration Act. That's not the case. That particular decision, al Madini and al Madini, <coughs> rests very squarely on the facts of the case. On the facts of the case, the parties themselves had not agreed to arbitration. So it was never in any doubt that the courts of the state would refuse to enforce that arbitration award. As the High Court made clear, the ISC, the Islamic Sharia Council of Britain, of London, was not, in this instance at any rate, an arbitration tribunal. And indeed, media reports suggest there's at least one example of an Islamic court operating under the Arbitration Act, the Muslim Arbitration Tribunal, MAT. But what is the truth behind the headlines? Because the headlines, again, quite confidently said, Sharia law is in Britain explanation marks. What's the truth? Now, before I answer that question, I must say a quick word about sources. There's quite a bit of information about the MAT on their website, matribunal.com, um, which is very full and includes more information than you could acquire about most other religious courts in this country. In addition to this, one of the things we've set up in the law school as part of the Centre for Law and Religion is our Interfaith Legal Advisors Network. And the purpose of this network is to bring together lawyers representing or working for various religious groups to share common experiences. And in January 2009, we met to discuss religious courts. And our number included a representative of the MAT. Now, although the event itself was private, and I can't tell you what was discussed at the meeting, we did decide to publish written responses to a questionnaire on our website. And if you allow me, I will be quoting in from some of the MAT submissions because they are particularly interesting. <coughs> Both the submissions and the MAT website makes it crystal clear that they operate under the Arbitration Act. 
they are also very clear about what areas of law they deal with. This is what they told us in our questionnaire. All areas of civil and personal religious law can be dealt with by MAT. The only areas of law MAT cannot deal with are divorce proceedings, other than a religious divorce, child custody, and criminal matters, as the MAT does not have the jurisdiction to deal with such matters. In such instances, the applicants will be referred to the civil courts and or any other appropriate authority, which is precisely the situation I just described to you. And they go through describing in depth how their decisions are made, um, the fact they allow legal representation, and how their decision makers are selected. I won't read you the extracts. Like I say, they're all on the website. What is particularly interesting, and is worth in full, is an extract at the very start of their submission, where they're quite keen to distinguish themselves from other religious courts, and other Islamic courts in particular. This is what they say. Here in the United Kingdom over the past 30 or so years, a system of informal Sharia councils has developed, dealing almost exclusively with Islamic family and personal law. In some cases, these Sharia councils have assisted in attempting to resolve disputes between two parties and to effect reconciliation. However, as these Sharia councils do not have any set procedural rules governing their conduct, nor do they operate under the Arbitration Act 1996, their decisions are not binding, and as such, rely solely on the goodwill of the parties to agree to follow and implement any decision reached by the Sharia court. Now, if you want to be cynical, you might want to question whether that is a question of the goodwill of the parties or the free will of the parties. But leaving that aside, it's also clear, once you look at the documents in full, that the MAT itself also operates outside the Arbitration Act. It also exercises religious functions in addition to legal functions. And this is exactly the same as the Beth Din. There's been a recent report by the Centre for Social Cohesion, which really emphasises throughout these two distinct functions, the legal functions under the Arbitration Act, and religious functions. And it's often suggested that these religious functions are extra legal. In other words, those decisions are not legally binding at all. But that's not quite true. The general provisions I referred to at the start of the lecture may still be relevant. The doctrine of consensual compact, meaning that the rules and structures of voluntary associations are binding on ascending members the Long and the Bishop of Cape Town case, and the fact that the courts of the state will exceptionally intervene to enforce those rules. The ways in which religious courts operate outside the Arbitration Act is largely unknown, and there is a need for much more research in this area. The relationship between religious and legal functions needs to be examined as does throughout the relationship between theory and practice. Right, in the dying minutes, I'll turn to the fourth head, the fourth way in which English law recognises Islamic law, and that's through private international law. Now, the term international law, we can just focus on definitions for two seconds, the term international law is used to describe systems of law that govern the relationship between states. The instruments of the UN, for instance. But technically, this is public international law and can be contrasted with private international law, which is the part of the national law of a country which establishes rules for dealing with cases involving the laws of other countries. It's also known as the conflict of laws and it's all concerned with foreign law. Typical situation would be uh, the recognition of marriages conducted overseas. A couple wed according to the law of Bangladesh, they arrive in the UK, is that marriage still valid? And the key test here is exactly the same as under the Arbitration Act. Does the 
the recognition comply with public policy. A recent case for Court of Appeal concerned marriage with telephone link between England and Bangladesh. One party was in England, one party was in Bangladesh, and the alleged lack of mental capacity of one party. The Court of Appeal held that yes, it was a valid marriage under Islamic law and Bangladeshi law, but it was not valid under English law. The marriage was, and this is a quote, sufficiently offensive to the conscience of the English court that it should refuse to recognise it. So in recap, English law currently recognises or allows Islamic laws and Islamic religious practices in many different ways. Despite the media headlines, there's many ways in which English law may be said to positively recognise religious laws and religious practices. As a matter of fact, through state law, by the Arbitration Act, and through private international law. English law already seems to offer a considerable degree of accommodation. And some of these provisions are quite well known. In relation to the MAT, it has a clear understanding of how it fits within the secular legal order. This has meant that many commentators have said that the Archbishop's speech and its proposals were not needed. However, there are a number of flaws in the current argument, in the current position. Much of what I've said is scattered in dozens of legal provisions in various different areas of the law. Some of those laws are terribly general, others are terribly specific. And it's difficult to see how it all fits together, and it's even more difficult to know how it fits together on the ground. The recognition of religious law is uneven, pragmatic, ad hoc, and largely unknown. And many commentators have criticized this piecemeal approach, such as the Hindu scholar Werner Mensky. He's criticized what he dubs the common law tradition of making exceptions in certain cases, calling the result a terrible mess, because almost everybody now feels that certain groups are receiving better treatment than others. He alleges that the government shies from admitting, uh, admitting its plurality, plurality conscious awareness using technical legal language, trying to keep out ethnic politics while working on practical solutions. That might be true, but that might not necessarily be a bad thing. If practical suggestions are being worked on, surely that's the most important thing. And if the reforms being made are pragmatic and piecemeal, does that really matter? So the main theme of the lecture has been the need for greater understanding of the interaction between Islam and English law. The Archbishop's nuanced lecture deserves nuanced responses. And part of that nuance is the recognition of the complex ways in which Islam and the law already interact. The Archbishop's lecture seems to have increased our interest in this area, particularly in relation to academia. There's been a large number of largely theoretical works over the last two years. But much more needs to be done. Much more needs to be found out. Because understanding the law is not just about words on paper. It's about understanding how these laws are used on the ground, how the legal and the religious interact. The Archbishop's lecture resulted in a great media furor, but there is still a great deal we don't know, the practicalities, the realities. In short, the things that really matter. I'm therefore pleased, um, as was indicated at the start of the lecture, that the Arts and Humanities Research Council and the Economic Social Research Council are funding research from Cardiff, which will begin to answer those very questions. That research is going to bring together researchers from the Centre for the Study of Islam in the UK, Cardiff Law School, and the Centre for Law and Religion. The project, Social Cohesion and Civil Law, will focus on marriage and divorce in religious courts, comparing three religious courts in detail, a Jewish Beth Din 
a matrimonial tribunal of Roman Catholic Church and a Muslim Sharia court. It will look at what the law is in the books, but also, crucially, what the law is in practice. It will involve interviewing key personnel and looking at decisions. The project begins in April this year and will run for a year and will include a symposium at Cardiff in March 2011. I hope tonight's lecture has shown the need for this research. Two years on from the Archbishop's lecture, this remains a controversial topic. But most of all, this remains a misunderstood topic. And progress cannot be made in any direction unless we understand the current position. We need to understand the interactions between Islam and English law today before we make value judgments as to how we want that interaction to develop tomorrow. And that requires understanding not only the precise letter of the law, but how that law is interpreted and used on the ground. Uh, the, the website address, the MAT, matribunal.com. Um, and to find the um, submission to our Interfaith Legal Advisors Network, just click on the Law School website, which you can access from the Cardiff University website, uh, Research Centre, Centre for Law and Religion, and then look for Interfaith Legal Advisors Network and the networks. It's as simple as that. <laughs> Yeah, and that was one of the points. Yeah, and that was one of the points which, if you read the lecture, uh, the Archbishop was stressing throughout, was the fact that Sharia law is very, very different from Western law in the way in which it's constructed, and also perceptions, because we our perception of the law is uh, of this sort of overarching, homogeneous chunk, you know, uh, which isn't the case at all. I was slightly amused to be introduced as Russell Sandberg from law earlier, which made me feel a little bit like Robocop. <laughs> you know, I am the law. But, um, which is fine, you know, feel free to do that. Um, my, my word is final. But yeah, that, that idea um, and that misconception. Um, but of course, if you read the lecture, it's quite clear that, you know, mm. uh, the Archbishop w was more aware than most of us, actually, at how sophisticated Sharia is, and how he kept on about the need to, ref to mention Islamic laws as opposed to Islamic law. But I mean, the problem largely is the fact that he was delivering the lecture in the evening, and it was already being reported on on the 10 o'clock news. Now, none of those reporters would have read the lecture. Um, even if they had read it, and this is not a critique of journalists, it's debatable how much they would have understood of it, because it was written in rather, I'm trying to be polite here, woolly prose. I'll, I'll settle for woolly prose. I mean, there's a, there's a little bit of it, just a little, little, little bit, where he refers to some work which I've done. Um, it's only a sentence, but I swear to you, I had to read that sentence three or four times to work out, A, if he was paying a compliment or not. <laughs> he was, thank goodness. Uh, which is why I haven't been overly critical tonight, and B, whatever does he mean? I mean, you know, that sentence puts my work much more eloquently um, than I've ever put it, but I'm not quite sure I fully understand what he's paying me a compliment for. <laughs> but I'll take it anywhere. I'll take compliments wherever they come. So I, I don't know how you uh, interpret all this, but I think the constitution, 
constitution defines, you know, I mean, it can relate, uh, it can refer to Islamic Christian, you know, Jewish law, or whatever law. But I think, uh, you know, in every state, the government decides what areas will take from what whatever religious, religious laws are relevant. Do you think that is the case? That's a good point. And of course, that's one reason why the UK response has been pragmatic and piecemeal. Because we don't have one document which is a written constitution. Um, the nearest we get to it, arguably, is the Human Rights Act. And like I said earlier, Article 6 of that, which relates to a fair trial, would have clear ramifications in relation to um, any religious court operating. So that's, that's, that's a valid point. But like I say, it's, it's complicated because of the UK's unique constitutional position. And it's usually the case, whenever anyone says that, they then critique it and say how terrible it is, and we must have a, a written constitution, and it must be nice and polished and shiny in one box. Um, but I think that's a lie as well. Um, there's a certain... I have a certain fondness of our unwritten constitution because most of the time it kind of gets it right um, in ways which a codified constitution with the harsh letter of the law possibly wouldn't. And I base that simply on the fact that when we've codified religious rights, the Human Rights Act, the law on religious discrimination, that hasn't actually increased religious freedom. It's increased litigation, but it hasn't actually increased religious freedom that much. I mean, I I'm tempted to go to another question, but I'll just amuse you a second before I do. I stumbled last night, flicking through the channels, as you do, on Channel 4 News. Oh, what, 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 what an innovation that was, John Snow and his nice times. And he was having a go at a government minister uh, on the basis of these three politicians who've been arrested uh, under the expenses scandal. And the short line of John Snow's attack last night was, they're thinking of relying on a law from 1689. That's disgusting. You've claimed, you've claimed, government minister, to have reformed parliament, but here they are relying on a law from 1689. That's completely wrong. Now, the government minister didn't respond very clearly. Surprise, surprise. But that attack is complete nonsense. The age of a law makes no difference to its effectiveness. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. <laughs> and it's a, the actual piece of legislation is the Bill of Rights. Are you seriously suggesting, Mr. John Snow, that we sweep through our constitutional history and go, ooh, that looks a bit old, let's change it? Because not wanting to be cynical, I don't think that works. So I just put that by the by as a sort of a, a, a staunch defence um, for ad hoc piecemealism. And why not? Anyone else? Yes. A lot of laws within religion relate to the customs in that religion. And male circumcision has been practiced in the Jewish religion since Isaac once was told. Now, female circumcision in this country is considered an assault, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Well, it's, it's the point of the law being silent. Uh, obviously, the law can't deal with everything unless there's a particular social problem. And I would suggest that it, it's, it's one of those anomalies which ought to be dealt with at some point, I would have thought. Um, but you get the problem of, you know, you, you can pass a law on something that doesn't necessarily change social realities. I'll give you two quick examples which have both been on the BBC website yesterday. The first news story yesterday was about the Sikh Kerpa. And the most senior Sikh judge, whose name escapes me, came out and complained that there isn't enough accommodation afforded to the Sikh Kerpa in the public sphere. I almost fell off my seat when I read that, because I know the law, and the law provides a crystal clear legal right. But apparently, schools, etc., are ignoring that, and there's been no end of dispute. So that's an example of the difference between dealing with it as a matter of law and getting to the heart of a social problem. I mean, I'm obviously biased, and I spent the last 50 minutes talking about law, but law is not the answer to every solution. 
but nevertheless, I think that's an anomaly there which really ought to be fixed. The other example, because just notice I said I was going to give you two, I gave you one, which is very naughty. Uh, the other example is the report yesterday um, done by the BBC of the amount of Muslim marriages which never have civil law effect, which are religious marriages only, and um, th there's no civil ceremony. And again, you know, if you look at the law, the law seems crystal clear on that. There shouldn't be a problem. So there's that sort of intermesh. However sophisticated you develop your legal regime, you're never going to quite cover every sort of social situation. But nevertheless, I think that's one clearly one, was if there was lobbying. Um, because, of course, the other big thing is parliamentary time. But if there was lobbying, it's, it's, it's a lacuna which ought to be filled in. Uh, I get a perception from your lecture that a kind of parallel system in some areas of law is existing in this country right now with Sharia law and religious laws. Uh, I was just wondering if we go a couple of decades back, we can see that we have less influence in terms of arbitration laws and other laws. Uh, we have more like no influence of other parallel systems. So I was just wondering the way forward, wouldn't it be like less and less influence of religious bodies or? more have like a single system and more a liberal system kind of, uh, or it's just to be a forward is more religious intervention in law? Well, that's, that's a fascinating question. If I was standing here 15 years ago, my answer would be yes, secularization generally happening, religion's losing its social interest. But you don't need me to tell you that hasn't exactly happened. Um, it's very difficult to get out of crystal balls and potentially foolhardy. But I think it's worth bearing in mind that religious laws, if we can just use the general term, have existed since way back. The t those partic what particular religious laws will differ from generation to generation, depending upon the makeup of the UK. Yeah? But, um, you know, there's a huge historical debate as to the medieval ages. And it's exactly the same debate, actually, that we're having now about two different systems of law, the law of the state and religious law. But in the medieval ages, it wasn't English law and Islamic law, it was English law and Roman Catholic law. Um, and one of the other things we have law school is we run an LM in canon law, which teaches the law of the Church of England, the law of the Roman Catholic Church, and the law of the state. And if you're interested in that, I have got flyers with me. But um, I had to get a plug in somewhere. It, it will be relevant, trust me, it will be relevant. Um, and one of the seminars we do on my course looks at that particular debate, which is exactly the same debate we're having now in the medieval period. And it's fascinating because it's exactly the same issues. You know, I'm allergic to the idea that every generation is unique and every generation's problems are different. I don't think that's the case. Obviously, there's difference. Obviously, you know, you. you Lives are shaped by social interactions. Um, this whole lecture tonight is shaped to an extent by the events of September the 11th. Yeah? But nevertheless, I think there are general questions, uh, which is basically the idea of communities coming before this distant thing called the law, which are sort of universal values. You know, um, if you want a high culture example, tough, I'm not going to give you one. I'll give you a low culture example instead. Uh, last week's episode of Survivors on BBC One. Um, the the programme's about people living in, a, in an age where most people have been killed by a deadly virus. Um, and in that very sort of embryonic society, you've got systems of customary law spread now. So, you know, I, I think it's part of the human condition, if I can be allowed to be that... Uh, that vague. Well, thank you very much. I think we've run out of time, actually, which is a testimony to the interest that both the lecturer and the subjects, but most importantly, I think the speaker, has aroused about. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much. Thank you.